Welcome. Uh, we apologize. We've had some technical difficulties, but we think we've got everything up and running, and we're ready to begin the webcast. My name is Dawn Cassidy. I'm the Director of Education for the National Council on Family Relations, and I'm here with Jason Samuels, NCFR's Director of Innovation and Technology. And we're going to be, jo we're going to be joined by Deb Gentry. She's going to be joining us from her home in Illinois. She's the Academic Program liaison um, and works closely with the academic program review. She works with the new programs that people that are applying to be uh, approved for the first time as well as um, programs that need to renew their, their program approval. So she's well qualified to present this web webcast on tips for applying for CFLE program approval. Um, and so with that I will turn the stage over to Deb Gentry. Well, I'm very glad to be here with everyone today. It is minus six degrees here in my location, but I am comfortable and warm inside and eager to talk about this topic at hand. So let's begin with the next slide. <clears throat> and emphasize here that the National Council on Family Relations, NCFR, sponsors the only program to certify family life educators. Next slide. There are two paths to certification. There is the CFLE exam. That exam is administered several times each year and new and ongoing family life professionals can take that exam. Uh, maybe this is an option for you if you do not return to the too fast. <clears throat> this CFLE exam might be an option for you or a colleague if you aren't already a CFLE. And of course the second path to cert certification is the abbreviated application process and that is our focus of today. Next slide. The purpose of the academic program review is to recognize schools offering undergraduate and or graduate degree programs this is too fast. Thank you. Offering undergraduate or graduate degree programs that include coursework that follows the standards and criteria needed for approval as a provisional certified family life educator. Next slide. Applications are reviewed by the NCFR Academic Program Review Committee, the APR we'll call it. The APR too quick. The APR will approve programs that meet CFLE standards and criteria. These standards and criteria are based on the 10 family life content areas. And we'll spend more time on that in a few minutes. Next slide. There are currently 127 graduate and undergraduate programs offering uh, that are approved and you can find their names you can find their names if you visit the ncfr.org website. Uh, upon getting to that website, there is a tab for CFLE certification, and then from that, a pull-down menu, for, and you would click on Academic Institutions. Once you see all the listed academic institutions that have approved programs, you can also see a lineup of the courses that comprise their academic program. You might be curious to see which courses they use to meet which needs. All right, next slide. <clears throat> what exactly are the benefits of the academic program approval process? Well, there are several. And next slide. Approval allows to, uh, excuse me, approval allows schools to offer their graduates the opportunity to apply for provisional certification using an abbreviated application process. Students receive a very comprehensive training in the 10 content areas that make up family life education. And students graduating from a CFLE approved program don't have to take the exam. Next slide. Academic departments gain a competitive edge, especially in this time of hard uh, economic uh, stressors and budget cuts. When states and colleges and universities are facing such budget cuts, department affiliations, 
and accreditations and designations are helpful in demonstrating the qualities of their program or the quality level of their program. Next slide. Students also pay a reduced application fee for this particular option. It is $110 that would come out of the student's pocketbook as compared to $190 uh, that would be needed to pay for the fees to take the CFLE exam for professional certification. <clears throat> Academic program review brings greater recognition, we think, to the profession of family life education and then subsequently to family programs by the fact that we have defined our standards and criteria. CFLE introduces family students and new professionals to NCFR and we are certainly hopeful that that will then become their professional home. Next slide. We have a testimonial to share with you today by Sylvia Assay, PhD in CFLE. She's at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. We feel that the CFLE certification has increased our credibility and the desire for our students to enter our program. We have been pleased with the support that we receive from NCFR as well as the professional opportunity, opportunities it has afforded. We're grateful that she shared that testimonial with us. Next slide. <clears throat> Let's make sure that we emphasize that CFLE approved programs must offer coursework that covers the 10 family life content areas. And so from here we're going to talk a bit about those 10 content areas. One document that would be handy to have, we did not uh, tell viewers to have it on hand for today, but that would be the handbook. The Handbook for Academic Program Review Application Processes. And in it, it goes through some considerable more detail about each one of these family content areas. Let me just remind you of them, especially if you don't have the handbook in front of you. Families and individuals in societal contexts. Internal, oops, let's go back, let's list them all. Internal dynamics of families human growth and development across the lifespan, human sexuality, interpersonal relationships, family resource management, parent education and guidance, family law and public policy, professional ethics and practice, family life education and methodology, and then I suppose we could also have added the internship or practicum experience. So for a little bit more detail on each one of these content areas, let's have the first slide. I'm not going to read each one of these bulleted items as each screen appears for a given content area, but for this very first one, I did want to take some time to emphasize what is in the handbook regarding these, how valuable the handbook can be in helping you to determine if you have one or more courses that might fit a given content area. For example, for this very first content area, it says that Families in Society has the purpose of uh, attending to and understanding of families and their relationships to other institutions, such as the educational, governmental, religious, and occupational institutions in society. It goes on to say that what would be appropriate content would be research and theories related to these bulleted items. And finally, the section about this content area in the handbook ends with six different outcomes for students. When they have taken the course and then graduate, we are hopeful that, for example, I won't read all six of them, but a CFLE can identify the factors that influence the relationship between work and family, for example. Or let's choose another one, that a CFLE can assess the impact of demographics, such as class, race, ethnicity, generation, gender, on contemporary families. <clears throat> I urge you, if you're going to embark on this process of preparing paperwork to submit for first-time approval, that you utilize the handbook quite closely. So next content area, let's see what it entails. Internal dynamics of families. I'll give you a moment to read those six bulleted items, and then I might make a comment about uh, something that I think is important. <clears throat> I 
this particular content area is all about building, maintaining, nurturing, perhaps even dissolving relationships, dyads or other more complex relationship groups. Friendship could perhaps be a part of this particular content area. All right, let's move on to the third content area. Human growth and development across lifespan. It's been my observation that some programs have just one very comprehensive course that deals with the entire lifespan, all the different developmental stages. But there are other programs, especially ones that want to, <clears throat> um, as one of their goals, devote extra attention to human growth and development. They may have one, two, or three different courses that they want to put up to uh, meet this particular content area. And those courses would meet different stages, would be focused on different stages of development. All right, and let's go to the next one. Human sexuality. Human sexuality is uh, a big topic here. I'll give you a moment to read all of the bulleted items. Sometimes this course is one that is serviced by a department different than the one that is seeking approval, and that is okay. There are some limitations of doing that that I'll speak to later, but sometimes there might be a psychology class or a sociology class or a um, health, human health services course that might provide the content and, and uh, important activities related to this content area. And it would be outside of the home department. All right, let's go on to the next content area. Interpersonal relationships. Once again, this is a, um, another uh, content area that is focused on building and maintaining and nurturing and dissolving relationships. We see that self and others is a bulleted item there and relating to others. Communication and actually conflict resolution. If I might take a moment, I think I misspoke about some aspects of importance about the uh, internal dynamics of families. Could we go back to that particular screen? Thank you, thank you. Actually, this particular content area, it would be a great place to talk about theories of family dynamics, what makes families tick, to talk about the um, suppositions, propositions, assumptions of those theories. One theory that we very much want to see emphasized would be family systems theory. But there are many others that should also be have students be exposed to. Sorry that I didn't make that distinction. Um, thank you for letting me have that opportunity to clarify, and now let's move ahead to where we should be, and that would be family resource management. Family resource management, let me allow you a few moments to read those five bulleted items. What I want to speak to about this would be the goal setting and decision making as well as the development and allocation of resources. Typically I see courses that are devoted primarily to monetary resources. But reviewers and myself are always pleased when we see that other resources are being attended to too. Uh, for, exam for example, time management, the use of space, energy, food, and even networks of support. So we urge you to not forget the other resources besides just monetary ones. Let's move on to the next content area. Parent education and guidance. And I'll let you take a moment to look over those bulleted items. I'd like to speak to parent-child relationships. It would seem the majority of courses that we review 
are about parent-child relationships where the child is young or perhaps even adolescent. I think we reviewers would suggest that even in such a course, we could talk about the parent-child relationship in later life, midlife and later life. It's important to look at the changing parental roles over the life cycle. Let's move on to the next content area. Family law and public policy. <clears throat> I'll let you take a moment to look at the bulleted items. Ideally, an academic program has the resources to offer a standalone course that can address these content areas and expectations. Sometimes that's not possible, and it may be that a course outside of the home department is turned to, or that in other courses that the department teaches, that aspects of family law and public policy is woven into each one of those. That's a little harder to maintain, to assure over time, that the information about family law and public policy really is being well integrated into those other courses. As I said before, ideally we hope that this is a standalone course. In looking at those bulleted items, we certainly see courses that deal with policy education as well as policy advocacy. And I'd want to note that NCFR has a number of resources that can help faculty put this course together uh, if it doesn't already exist or to polish it up, to revise it and revamp it. Uh, the family policy section of NCFR is responsible for many of those good resources that we hope you turn to. Next screen. Professional ethics and practice is an important content area. Similar to the previous one, we hope that a, a program has enough resources to make this a standalone course. Many times we've seen, though, that some of these issues are woven into multiple courses. Um, and the same limitations happen in this case, too. <clears throat> Similar to my remarks about family law and public policy, NCFR has some wonderful publications about ethics uh, and codes of conduct. And we hope that those are well utilized. <clears throat> and next slide. Family life education methodology. I'll leave you a moment to read those bulleted items. This is an important course. Typically, we see it being offered to juniors and seniors. I don't want to underplay the third bullet or evaluation. Sometimes we see courses that spend a good deal of time on needs assessment and instructional design and implementing of family life education offerings, but don't spend too much time on program evaluation. We like to see something that has the breadth of that entire continuum. Education techniques, knowing your audience, being sensitive to their differing and di diverse needs and expectations is important. Next slide. And of course, the whole experience is capped off with an internship or a practicum experience. Typically, this is a three credit hour course, although we have seen two. The bottom line is that there has to be a minimum of 120 hours spent in contact with the audience being served by this practicum or internship experience. <laughs> we are hoping that students are choosing sites with your guidance that have persons on staff that will supervise them that are committed to demonstrating playing the role of a family life educator for the student to observe and then giving the student plenty of experience to practice the skills of family life education, the tasks, the duties, the roles that are involved while they are there. <clears throat> Next slide. Application for first-time approval and then sub subsequent renewals are made electronically. I am glad to, when it comes time for you to know about this means of uploading documents, 
to give you the email address. It will uh, allow you to upload four or five documents at a time to a SharePoint site. The handbook, and we've been discussing its value for the application process, can be also downloaded from the NCFR website. And uh, I think hand in hand, using the handbook as well as emails and conversations by phone with me, it will get you off to a good start of organizing your materials. Next slide. Here are some requirements. The first two go together quite well. At least one member of your faculty or instructional staff that will be involved with students in this effort needs to have a CFLE designation. At least one member needs to be a NCFR member. What we think is important about this is that there is at least one person, and we hope more than one person, who is providing a, a role model effect at saying, here, I have this designation. I am a member of this professional organization. It is important to me, and it will be important to you in your professional life. Another requirement is that the institution, the college or university, needs to have accreditation by a regional accrediting body. And we've listed here the most common ones that we see in applications, depending upon the region of the country that you live in. What should the application itself be comprised of? <clears throat> Actually, there's sort of two parts. The first two bullets fit together nicely. A completed application form and an accompanying fee. The form and the directions for submitting it can be found on our website about this whole process. And it can be submitted in a couple of different forms. You can submit by traditional mail. You can uh, submit by fax or by scanning a document and attaching it to an email. It is possible that the fee can be paid with a credit card or it can be paid via a check that your business office would cut. The original application for and of course the fee payment needs to go to headquarters and a copy then is provided to me. The next part is uh, a mixed bag, oops, not next slide, but I'm wanting to explain the next part of the application contents. Thanks for going back. The next part is a combination of a narrative that describes your program and your requirements, what a student would have to take course-wise in order to graduate, as well as what they're going to take to accomplish the CFLE approved program. A copy of each one of the syllabi for the different courses that are going to be involved in this approved program need to be provided. And all of these uh, documents would then be uploaded, as I said before, through an electronic portfolio process to a SharePoint site. Next slide. One form or table that needs to be completed and included in the application would be Appendix E of the handbook. It is a table where you can then list you can see here in this example that there are the 10 content areas listed there as well as the internship. So you would list the one, perhaps two courses in each one of the content areas in that blank space that you are saying you want to be evaluated, assessed towards meeting the particular expectations of that content area. You would put the course number and acronym and title down in each case for all of the syllabi, or all of the courses. Thank you. Next slide. Another form or table chart that needs to be included is the checklist. This is an important document that students should be aware of as early as possible in their program, their studies with you. If they are going to pursue the CFLE through this option, then they need to be aware of which courses are going to help them to accomplish which content area uh, qualifications. And so uh, it is also not only guiding them during their time of uh, conducting their studies, 
But after they graduate, this is the form that they submit to headquarters for review in this application process to become in the abbreviated application process. All right. Here are some best but not only practices. There are best practices, but I see exceptions to them in a number of different cases. So let's talk about the, the best practices and perhaps here along the way identify some ways that you could depart with good reason. We hope that the courses that are going to be approved are required courses for your students to graduate in their respective major rather than being elective. We also hope that the courses are provided by your own home department. The reasons for this is that the courses are off, likely offered more often, more regularly, with more seats available to the students. And thus, they aren't having to fight other students for seats. They're getting the courses accomplished in a timely and efficient mm -hmm. way. Sometimes courses offered by different departments want to give their own students priority and thus leave fewer seats for students from outside that department. We hope that one or two courses are listed in a given content area and that a given course appears in no more than two content areas. Once again, I have been persuaded and reviewers have been persuaded to perhaps have exceptions but this is our rule of thumb. We'd like students to take, um, we want the, the process of students taking courses for the CFLE to be as manageable as possible. To not have the number of courses be so great, so numerous, that it is a burden to them. So uh, we try to keep it lean and then look for your explanations if you have to depart from that. The last bulleted item I want to spend some time on saying, uh, reinforcing its importance. You must have a solid plan and implement that plan for how you're going to inform, mentor, and advise your native students that start out with you as freshmen as well as transfer students that might come in as upperclassmen uh, about this program, its benefits, its advantages, and its expectations, all of its requirements. Thanks. Let's have the next slide. Syllabi should feature the following components. We'd like to see a course description. You can probably lift that right out of your course catalog. We'd like to see course objectives and or student learning outcomes. These need to be worded in a particular way. They need to be student focused. I have seen some syllabi in which what is written in this part of the syllabus is what the faculty mm -hmm. intends to do, what they hope their plans are for providing the students with exposure to the content. What we'd rather see are objectives that are focused on the student. Upon the completion of this course, the student should be able to. Able to do what? Able to know what? Able to behave in what kinds of ways? We'd like to see a topical content outline. It needn't be pages and pages long, but we would like to see what kinds of topics, concepts, issues are going to be discussed in the course. We'd like to see a listing of required and supplemental readings. And these listings need to be in full and complete and proper uh, bibliographic citation order. We'd like to have descriptions of the learning activities and the assignments that the students are going to be exposed to. We hope that these are varied and meaningful. We'd like to see description of the means of assessment and evaluation of student learning. And once again, we hope these are varied and meaningful. We don't want to see papers being overused. We hope that the uh, course isn't completely made up of exams as a means of assessing student learning and evaluation. We also would like to have a course calendar or schedule. The detail of that calendar or schedule is dictated on, by comparison, how much detail was provided in the topical content outline. What the course calendar and schedule allows reviewers to do 
is to see how much time is being devoted to the key concepts and topics and issues of the course and how well then the expectations of that content area are going to be met. When a calendar or schedule is bare bones, perhaps only listing the fact that in week two, uh, chapter two is going to be read and the title of that chapter, it's not giving the reviewers adequate insight into the nature of what is going to be done during that two weeks. All right, let's go on to the next slide. <clears throat> Here is a guide that I have found useful in sharing with those that are looking over their syllabi and maybe taking an opportunity to readdress their learning objectives, their student learning outcomes. Bloom's taxonomy has recently been revised and this is a diagram showing the <clears throat> an evolution from bottom to top of less rigorous, more elementary cognitive skills that are being expected out of students to the pinnacle at the top being the most rigorous and challenging cognitive levels of expectations for students. So I would think of a course that most freshmen and sophomores are going to be taking. There would be student learning outcomes phrased in this way. Upon the completion of this course, the student will be able to explain something, interpret something, predict, solve, illustrate, compare, contrast, describe. Now, for juniors and seniors and graduate students, we're looking for the predominance of learning outcomes to be expecting students to do analyses, evaluation, and creation kinds of cognitive skills. Upon the completion of this course, the student should be, it will be able to analyze, blah, 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 explain, distinguish, judge, justify, debate, invent, compose, construct, design. There are plenty of piece, uh, resources out uh, on the web about Bloom's taxonomy. Most of them, I would say, are good quality and credible. I'd be glad to give you some direction about that if you're not already acquainted with Bloom's revised taxonomy. But a simple um, plugging in Bloom's revised taxonomy into your search engine should lead you to some more information if you'd like to read about it further. Next screen. <clears throat> Three members of the the uh, APR committee and myself review the syllabi that are submitted and we have some criteria in mind as we do it. In fact, we have a couple of rubrics that we have sitting beside us as we are reading these syllabi and other documents that you submit. I'd be glad to share the rubrics with you in advance. It might be a tool for you to use in processing or assessing what you think your your syllabi are accomplishing and uh, in preparation for your final submission of those documents. <clears throat> the academic review committee consists of right now about a dozen members and then myself. Three members are volunteer or appointed, some combination of that approach, to review each of the applications and then of course I do. What we are looking for is that the content of the course or courses match content area expectations. We look at what is said in the handbook and make a determination as to the degree to which uh, those expectations are being met. It is probably hard to have every single content item expressed in the handbook about a content area accomplished, but we're hoping that th that's a goal. That that programs work towards that. Perhaps with 90% of the content area being attended to. We also look at the objectives, the outcomes, the assignments, the activities, the means of assessment and evaluation and we hope they are meaningful and, and reflect adequate rigor. We are hoping that approved programs is a sign of uh, that a student who has gone through an approved program uh, that the rigor involved implies that it is of good quality 
that they could, if they were needing to, take the exam, pass the exam with flying colors. We want that designation to mean something to employers, and so we, we do look at the rigor of the, of the course. We also like to see the readings and resources that are current and scholarly. It is not that lay materials can't be infused into a course, but the predominant, the primary resources being used, we look at the scholarliness of uh, those pieces. Time devoted to critical topics and issues is suitable. Once again, we try to determine that in several ways by looking at the syllabus, the calendar, and a number of other pieces of the syllabus to get a sense of how much time is being devoted to these critical topics. The internships and the practicums involved have a significant emphasis on family life education tasks and duties. So that's a lot to be looking for. Our reviewers take considerable time to look over the materials that are submitted and to give feedback in to our SharePoint site, which I summarize, add my own, and then send off to the point person with the given program when it's time for them to know of our results. I'm willing to work together with that person to see how they might go about any revisions if there are any. Next slide. Once approved, what happens? Well, I think there should be a lot of celebration. The process need not be onerous, but I have to admit there is some time that's required to get the application together and reviewed and the results back and all the uh, final components of an approved program put in place. So some celebration is in order, followed by implementation of a good marketing and publicity plan. How are you going to let students both in other departments who might like to transfer into yours, your current native students, your colleagues, fellow, fellow faculty and faculty and sister departments, uh, parents, and certainly employers in the area know about the existence of your approved program. I had mentioned before how important it is to advise students early to let them know about the existence of this option and what is involved. Of course, as time goes on, we're hoping that you are in a mode of continuous assessment of the program and looking for ways to improve it. There are five year windows of opportunity to do that. There's a formal renewal process every five years and at that time, uh, that's just a prime time, then to have new syllabi submitted for review to explain any changes that have gone on, any improvements that have taken place. <clears throat> and should there be a need to do those improvements, those revisions, uh, within that five-year period of time, let's say it's three years out, we can do some simple updates. Those updates generally are about things such as uh, we've changed a course number, we've changed a course title. Those are more editorial, pretty simple to process, and get your program updated, the checklist updated as it appears on our website. <clears throat> Graduates complete and submit the abbreviated application for provisional CFLE status um, well, right upon the time they graduate. It is perhaps a wonderful service that you can provide in some capstone course at helping them to understand what the paperwork what is the paperwork that is involved in that application and have them ready so that upon graduation they can get that submitted. They do have a two year window of opportunity to get that done. One note that I want to make is that students should be made aware through the advising process that they're not going to be able to make more than two substitutions for any of the approved courses on the checklist. There are reasons why substitutions might be in order. For example, transferring a course in. The transferring of a course is considered a substitution. So 
if there are substitutions needed, it's always wise to talk with someone in headquarters. That would be Maureen Bourgeois or Don Cassidy about the suitability of, of a, a given course that you're thinking about or the student is thinking about as a substitution. More on that later. Perhaps a whole other um, webcast could be devoted on, on those aspects. Let's take a look at the next slide. And that's calling for questions. And so I don't know if any have been sent to Jason or not. So far, we don't have any questions, Deb. But we're going to give this just a minute or two to see if anybody would like to submit a question via email or to call in live here. OK. I could fill a little bit of time, I suppose, with saying that each time the CFLE Network publication comes out, I have a column in it, and I try to provide something very practical in each column. This one that I'm holding up happens to be to flip or not to flip, talking about the benefits and cautions to flipping the classroom and some of the resources or books that are out now on the shelves to help faculty do that. In this particular one, I talked about how one might flip a classroom within a course that would be um, applicable to content area 10, the family life education methodology content area. So be on the lookout for my columns. I think that they can be helpful to those who are, are planning to submit for the first time. They can also be helpful to those that are approaching a renewal time. Uh, review. Um, this is Dawn. I just wanted to mention that we do have a, um, a PowerPoint presentation on the abbreviated application process, how, you know, geared towards the student that or the graduate, how to complete the abbreviated application process, and going through more details um, from that side of things. That's on our website. And in addition, uh, Marine Bourgeois did the How to Become a CFLE. Um, session at the NCFR conference in San Antonio and we videotaped that and Jason broke down the video into segments on different aspects of the process. So it's very convenient where you can um, you can watch the whole video or if you just have a question about one or two parts of it you can just click on that part and that's also on our website under the abbreviated application process section. So uh, it doesn't seem like we have any questions just yet. If any do come in, we will forward them to you, Deb. And uh, in the meantime, for the archived recording, if there are ongoing questions here, Deb's contact information is up on the screen. And with that, we're going to move on to some closing remarks. So I want to thank you for your time and consideration. Um, we want to share a little bit of information about some of the, the um, opportunities we have with our webinars and webcasts. Uh, all of our webinars and our webcasts, the difference is the webinars we charge for the webcasts are free, um, but all of them are archived. And so they're obviously available for viewing um, in live broadcasts, but then afterwards. Um, the webinars are available for individual viewing for $25 for NCFR members and $50 for non-members. And as I said, there's no cost for webcasts. Uh, we also have the opportunity, you have the opportunity to watch the webinars in a classroom use. If you're interested, if you're a professor and you're interested in sharing some of this information um, with your students. And uh, the cost for that is $75 per webinar if you're an NCFR CFLE approved program and $150 if you're from a school that is not CFLE approved. Um, and that is for one year of unlimited <clears throat> classroom use. Uh, and if you're interested in that option, you can, purchase, you can um, contact Morgan Cole at morgancole at ncfr.org, and she can um, help you get access to that archive version. Um, some of the topics that we've held in the past, I just wanted to bring to your attention because we've got some great information up on our site. Uh, we've had webinars on the domains of family practice model, one on who, me, lead a group, which was led by uh, Jean Ilsley Clark about group facilitation skills. We've had a webinar on the topic of overindulgent parenting that was led by David Bredehoft and Jean Clark. And then we just in last month had one on using the family life education framework for program development evaluation. 
Um, so you're, you're encouraged to check those out on the website, um, either for your own use or if you're a professor in your classroom. Um, next slide. We also have some free webcasts, and those uh, have dealt with the topics of how to submit a conference proposal, how to review a conference proposal. We had one, which was our very first webinar that we held, um, gosh, a little over a year ago now, I guess, on the ethical thinking and practice um, process, which was uh, carried out by members of the Minnesota Council on Family Relations. And then now we have this, this current one on tips for applying for CFLE program approval. And we have others um, that we're planning for the, for the year coming forward. Some of the upcoming topics that we have scheduled for 2014, parents' use of social media. We'll be having one on tips for public policy involvement. We have one planned for conducting a systematic literature review. And we have other topics that um, we're just trying to finalize dates and times. So be sure to check out our website. There's a page where we have upcoming webinars. And then you'll also see a link to the archived webinars. Uh, I'm always looking for ideas for webinars and webcasts. If there's something that you'd like to hear about, if there's something that you'd be interested in presenting, please contact me. Give me a call or send me an email. Um, the information's on the screen here. Uh, ideally, I would like to have two or three years' worth of webinars in the, in the um, planning and have them ready to go. So let us know. And before we go here, Deb, we have one question that was submitted by Dr. Donna Hoskins at Bridgewater. Donna asks, we are designing new courses for some of our content areas. How many times does the course have to be taught before we can seek accreditation? Actually, um, I would say one time. In fact, as long as you, if it's going to be approved based on a, a syllabus that you are putting forward as a master syllabus to go through your curriculum committee processes, and it is indeed already approved by, say, your department, your college and university levels of curriculum committees, you could submit that and then say from here on out any student that takes this class will be exposed to this particular course. Um, in that way I suppose it doesn't even need to be taught once. If the expectation is though that we're approving it the very next semester that it would come up for, uh, that would come to be, we'd be hoping that that course would be offered and that students would be exposed to all of the content, the assignments, the assessments as that ma master syllabi um, prescribed or described. Um, and I, this is Dawn. I just wanted to, to chime in. Um, the, the word accreditation was used in the question. And I just want to clarify that NCFR does not provide accreditation. What we do is simply approve the program for meeting the CFLE standards. Accreditation typically gets into facility evaluation, site evaluation, and we just our, our review process is not to that scope. So what we provide is um, approval that your program meets the CFLE requirements. So just wanted to clarify that. OK. Well, I guess uh, we don't have any, any more questions at this time. As Jason shared, if you do have questions, um, feel free to email to Deb, um, Deb Gentry. We'll go back and put up her, her email address. And um, so it's just debgentry at ncfr.org, or you have her phone number as well. And you can always call me, too, if you have um, more typically questions about the abbreviated process. Uh, but either way, we'll get you to the right person. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to the next web webinar or webcast.